Yo, this there is he Anna. is. What's How's it up, going? Fans? How's it, my man? <laughs> I didn't get, I didn't get the, the memo for the uniform. Where's my t-shirt, guys? Yes, sis, uh, come on. Bad. Yes, sis. We're in the process of getting some, but the guy's yeah. taking his time in, uh, in Bali. Yes, he's too much <laughs> surfing, I reckon. Oh, okay, okay, fair enough. And you're both standing. So hang on, I'm also just... sitting. I also want to stand. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that but looks you powerful. Need to bring your computer. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's a power pose if I've ever seen it, like belittling yeah, yeah. everyone else. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, what yeah. do you guys want to know from up here? Let me tell you yes. what the weather's like. <laughs> and I used to tell my cousin who was 28 and I was 22 that, uh, why don't you come to a nightclub with me? And I was like, no, dude, I couldn't be bothered. I said, you're so old. I will <laughs> never grow that old. I will <laughs> always be drilling. And here we are. Here we are. Here we are. Yes, I man. always had to wake up like early in the morning because I had such short term memories. So I'd wake up in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, bang in my head. <laughs> Cram it all in. I don't know about you. I was terrible at school, man. Terrible. I, was, I couldn't scrape. I, I mean, I used to really be diligent. I'm diligent. I'm a diligent guy. Jeez, was I terrible at memorizing, man. I couldn't get anything in. I would study hard and then scrape through and my matric nice. results were actually in their 40s early 40s really wow man. <laughs> hey, but listen i mean listen you both always look good and gareth you look great but craig you look younger dude what's happened <laughs> i'm getting i get adjusted are you seeing a chiropractor boys huh? what's going on here? <laughs> well, what well, the last Is time i saw life? a chiropractor he didn't do anything to me if i was there for a week and he didn't even yeah yeah I, I i that is like my failing moment as a chiropractor not adjusting you in america i'm sorry i still feel bad about that yes. <laughs> yeah. well, like your, but besides chiropractic which i'm sure has its benefits what else are you doing what's happened that you you're almost decreasing in age but to be dead honest with you a lot of it is um uh, unwinding a lot of my old shit like what you talk okay. about in your book it's good, and okay. And I'm dealing with a lot of that and just like forgiving myself for stuff and, mm. and being honest and open with people about stuff I've done and my <coughs> partner. And, and honestly, it's like, it's a good, it's a, it's fucking cathartic to do eh? Well, listen, I mean, the thing is, is our bodies are, rep- I mean, you had, I mean, you had the king of this. What's his name? Um, Lipton. Belief, Lipton. Uh, Lipton. Yeah, of course. A biology of belief. Yeah. I mean, our bodies are a representation of our filter systems and our filter systems are our belief systems. And the minute you start changing and healing, there's your physicality changes. In fact, I think we're all getting younger. The more emotionally aware you become, the more you decrease in, in physicality age, you know? Well, I think it, 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 it requires courage to be okay to be disliked. And, and, and I think yeah. it's important for us to be okay with that, which goes against every grain of our being. Mm-hmm. Um, but ultimately, if you have become so clear in who you are, you won't even have time to worry about what other people are thinking, you know? And so that's the really place you want to get to is that not that you don't care. It's just that you're so focused elsewhere that yeah. it becomes irrelevant because cool, I want to just uh, also say to you guys, wow, wow, to what you've done. You've Thanks, thank you, man. Incredible people. I mean, uh, Lipton, uh, Seth Godin, uh, yeah. Gary V's person. I mean, these yeah. are just serious <laughs> global players. And look at you two, Thank man. Congratulations. You. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thanks, buddy. You appreciate well, it, man. It means yeah. a lot for coming from you, man. Seriously. Yeah. It yeah, does, man. Thank you. I mean, I wouldn't have come on if those guys weren't on. This is only because I saw that. I'm kidding. <laughs> but <laughs> you are they only came on. Yes. You were the first big name on the Ridiculous New York oh, Podcast. Yeah. Man. You were. Yeah, serious, you. serious. Episode six. Yeah. Promise you. But we were, we were, we're still flipping like nervous speaking to you. Like, I can't believe we've got John on yet. <laughs> well, thank you. And, and really, congratulations. I mean, it's a, thank you. It's, a, it's a busy world out there podcasting. And um, so, yeah, you guys have really done well. So, well done. Congratulations. Appreciate it. Thank you. And when we look, we really do have you to thank too, because it does make a difference when you have someone like yourself on, someone else sees that, they go, cool, that's... Um, you know, so, so it, it really is thanks to you as well. It's a mutual... It's a very mutual thing on this world, in the space that we're in, because... You, you, you scratch someone else's back and they scratch yours and, and suddenly you get another cool guest on. Mm-hmm. So we're definitely finding that, that it's kind of a cool mutualism that happens in the space. So yeah, thanks to you as well, but seriously. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah, no, my yeah. pleasure. Uh, and it's yeah. weird for me to hear that from you. You know what I mean? Because I'm still me. Yeah. And so I'm still yeah, inside totally. my own head. So when I hear that, I'm like, what are you talking about? I've still got so many insecurities <laughs> I'm trying to deal with and I'm like, I'm still worried about small little things. But yeah, okay, thank you. I appreciate it. Don't worry. stuff well good morning there mr john sarney thank you so much for joining us today bud on the ridiculously human podcast 
My absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me back. Oh, but it's a pleasure. So someone has a big day tomorrow. You're turning Ooh. 44. You got any cool plans, bud? Um, you know, actually, a lot of people are saying to me, what are you doing for your 44th birthday? And I'm doing one of my book launches tomorrow night at, uh, in Johannesburg. And I couldn't think of actually doing anything better in launching my book, doing what I love most, and having a whole bunch of people I don't know coming to support. I mean, could there be something better? I am all of a sudden having a birthday party for people coming to listen to me for an hour, willingly, yeah. willingly. So it's great. And you were just saying a moment ago that you've like almost never felt better. Like you're just feeling great. Uh, you, you know, at your age now, you've, you've almost bursting with more energy than, than you ever have before. Well, yeah, I, I, I am. And I think it's very much goes back to the process of understanding what ages us, how it ages us. And I think there's a couple of things that I've become aware of. One of them is that our memories, if they are heavy and are hurtful and resentful, they weigh us down. They create facial expressions that are naturally around resentment or sadness or grief, or whatever the case may be. So a lot of it's going to be done with me healing my past and accepting people as they were and as they are and myself as well. And that process has released me of old patterning. And the other thing is following your highest excitement and bliss gives you an opportunity to perceive time very differently. And the concept of time is obviously something we're starting to realize is quite linear and we are not linear beings. We are much more quantum beings. And uh, as Joe Dispenza says, you know, there's no time. There's only the eternal now. And mm -hmm. when you understand that concept and you understand that equation, you try and get yourself into the state of flow as often as possible. And in that state of flow, you don't age. Or you, mm -hmm. you hardly age. And in that state of flow, you constantly energize. And you only do what you love, not what you don't love. So your body, I suppose, becomes a representation of that joy, and focus on only following your bliss. And so, yeah, 44 awesome. has never felt better. Uh, awesome, yeah, it's buddy. epic, man. You're looking great, bud. And you can feel the energy, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Thank, you. Thank you so much. I see you've got a new uh, pair of specs there, or are these your like, kind of like uh, casual ones, bud? <laughs> these, these are actually, I'm at home. And so these are the ones I wear at home, which is so weird because when I'm, when I'm watching TV or, you know, I'm just chilling at home, these are the ones I wear. They might, they're almost like when I'm home, you know, you've got your like home clothes, I guess. I don't know. These are my Slippers. home clothes. Slippers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. uh, classic, man. Cool, bud. So, so look, this is actually your third time on our podcast. Uh, you were one of our first guests. And I remember like when we first had you on like episode six, we were super nervous. We were like, oh my God, we can't believe we're speaking to John Sane. And uh, like, it was like such a big deal for us. And it still is a massive deal for us. So, um, you know, thank you for giving us so much of your time. The, the, the second one was actually, we did a bit of a panel discussion with a couple of other guys. Um, both of those, we covered uh, two of your previous books. And here we are again on the third time. So it's super exciting, man. Yeah, thank you so much. And, and, and I've got to be honest with you, I get a, I, I'm very lucky to get a lot of requests to be on these uh, sort of interviews. And I really turn a lot of them down. And, and for me, it's very much the energy that you guys are exuding that attracts me and, and makes me very comfortable. And I don't think, I don't think I'm like giving up time. I, I feel like I'm spending time with other people with the same values, dreams and aspirations. So it's almost just so cool to have a discussion with you guys. And so my absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me back. The feeling is totally mutual, man. Thank you so much, bud. Yeah, sure. totally. And, and actually, yeah. like, I think for me personally, at least, and for Craig too, like that was the kind of start of a friendship. And since then, I've actually met you a couple of times in person. I've seen you speak. Um, the way you speak is amazing. It's really engaging, full of energy. And, and yeah, you just you, you teach people so much, bud. So you do bring this epic energy. And uh, congrats for everything you've achieved, man. It's been really great just to see this this progress and transformation and, and everything. It's, uh, it makes us proud. You know what I mean? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I, it's a, it's a, I mean, I've always been ambitious. Uh, I think I've, I've re-energized my ambition with excitement rather than anxiety. And by that switch and all the healing that I've done, there's this constant need for evolution. I don't, I don't, I, you know, there's always something new to learn. I mean, you guys are masters of it. I mean, it, Every time you interview somebody, it's an upgrade for your thinking. And mm -hmm. so me in my own world, I mean, I'm so hungry for evolution because more evolution, the more flow, the more flow, the more fluidity, the more fluidity, you're just, you're just gliding through life. You know, it's just such a wonderful experience. I'm almost like, what else can I do to keep <laughs> this sort of 
uh, ability to stay in the state of flow for longer, in fact, forever, if not pos- if, if I can. You know? Yeah, it's such a what good a goal. Feeling, yeah. yeah, definitely. And um, so, yeah, but like we said, we, we've already spoken to you a lot about your story in that first, um, yes. in that first show we did. Um, and so we encourage people to go and listen to episode six. But um, it's always good for new listeners to find out a little bit about uh, who John Sane is. So maybe you can just give us a few minutes about you and your background story. Sure. Um, my mom and dad are Iranian. I was made in Iran, but born in Africa. I'm a child of Africa my whole life. And my mom and dad got, went through a divorce. I was a single mom boy with my brother from about eight years old. We struggled quite a lot financially. And it was just a tumultuous time. My father wasn't uh, um, the most evolved human being. And uh, it, was, it was a very difficult process. And I was so sick and tired of being financially challenged from a very young age. I drove myself to all sorts of pain to become rich. And I drove myself to really, I I didn't care actually what I had to do. I just needed the freedom of financial freedom, which is what I didn't have. And I made a lot of money in my early 20s. I lost it all in my 30s. In my early 30s, I declared bankruptcy. And that process really began the process of me becoming introspective and really starting to understand why I was unhappy when I had no money why I was unhappy when I had money because I just wanted a little bit more and why I was unhappy now that I was bankrupt. And so this process really catalyzed my research into human psychology, awareness and consciousness into the sacred masculine that we carry as men. And then I've always been fascinated with the future. I've always been an early adopter. So I've combined these two topics that aren't usually combined to give an opportunity to people to become responsible for their perspective and to understand the future in a way that's categorized and contextualized and makes sense. And so I now write books, I lecture, I talk and I'm an entrepreneur and I'm living my best life, to be honest. Yes, that is one of the best synopsises anyone's ever given of themselves. That's, it's really good. And, uh, and it's so true. It's, it's such a great listening to you speak. You just hear that journey that you've been on and you speak a lot about going within, you know, uh, and dealing with a lot of stuff that from your past, as you mentioned, and, and really not shying away from it, but looking at head on and going there. And one of these things that you've done recently is, is been on one of uh, Joe Dispenza's week long advanced retreats. And we, Gareth and I are also massive Joe Dispenza fans. He's obviously a chiropractor as well. And, and you're uh, a massive fan. Yeah, and yeah. Um, so maybe you can just tell us a little, about, a little bit about him and your experience at the retreat, please. Uh, So it's my second one I've been on. It's my two seven-day advanced meditation retreats. I've made a commitment to myself to do at least one a year moving forward, if not two, if I can. Uh, Firstly, I'm such a fanboy of Dr. Joe Dispenza. I am uh, always interested in people's micro expressions when they are interacting with other people. And he is full of kindness and full of love. And and you can see his tonality and the way he speaks is just so centered And so not only am I a fan of his because of his public speaking, his authoring, but his masculinity. He just really carries himself in the most elegant way that I often don't see in other so-called helpers and gurus of that sort of sort. So he's done the work, you know. You know, the process with him is really, really cutting edge because I think ultimately all of us that were taught about meditation and taught about quantum fields and magnetic fields that are around us, all of us kind of wanted to believe it, but we were like, mm, is it real? Isn't it real? Like, but we would go with faith, you know, and you'd kind of have faith. What's awesome about him is that there's no faith needed. It's all been proven. So your left brain relaxes. So you don't have to keep asking that sort of, is this real? So that relaxes. And then you can really open up now and understand the theory and start practicing it and so you're meditating anywhere from six to eight hours a day Hmm. and uh, you are meditating with another thousand people so you can just imagine the energy that's uh, really elevated you and definitely the last time I finished now in Mallorca it was the most amazing thing because I could so, so ultimately what you're trying to do there is hold more light ultimately because what we are are beings of light and so how can you have a container that holds more light how can you have the capacity to contain this light and then when you become full of this light you are brighter and because you're brighter you see more 
Hmm. You see these invisible patterns. You see, hmm. you just see more because that's what happens. And it was the most incredible thing. I could walk past somebody and I could tell you about them. It was the most hmm. surreal feeling that I had this opportunity to do this. But this was after seven days of meditating, almost like nonstop, really. And so hmm. for me, he's a, a modern genius that's now given us the opportunity to spend time with him. And I imagine his courses are going to get bigger because more people want to join. And right now we're sitting on a thousand, but you know, those things are going to increase dramatically. And I think he's, I think he's just really beginning his journey now because he's really becoming more mainstream and uh, people are really starting to buy into the bigger picture of this. And again, this comes down to me not aging because of a lot of his stuff, you know? So I'm a fan for many, many reasons. I meditate still twice a day with his stuff. Yesterday, I was on my way to one of the book launches and I was feeling a bit tired. I caught a red eye flight and I thought to myself, how can I quickly change my energy? Like, let me just do a quick meditation. I did a 30 minute meditation of these. I felt my whole energy changed and I had so much energy again, you know? So wow. yeah, I'm a huge fan. A huge fan. That's cool. Man. How massively important that is, is that in life? What a, what a, that something can do that or you can do something in your life that can switch your energy around is literally life changing. Like what, what, what could have happened at that book launch if your energy was low or your energy was high, you know, that's the, that's the big difference. It's really huge. And, and you know, the, what I love about him is that he's giving you a tool set to awaken latent technology that's been with us forever. We just didn't have access to it. Hmm. That's what he's doing. He's giving us an equation to follow, to access our own genius. And so the difference between him and many other gurus is that the other gurus say, praise me. It's through my stuff. And he's like, no, 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 no. Don't worry about any of that. Just it's with you. Yeah. Go and go and do it yourself. You know? And that's, yeah. that's the magic of it, you know? And do you have like a practice that you do daily now yourself in terms oh, yeah, of meditation? Yeah, no. yeah, absolutely. There's um, getting your mind out your body meditation. It's about a 45 minute meditation where what he talks about is that your body has become addicted and become addicted to certain types of thinking, mostly anxiousness. And what happens is that when we see a situation that triggers us, our body's memory system reacts to it. So you have to take your mind out your body and bring your mind back to your mind. And so that's a 45 minute meditation. I also do blessing of the energy centers, which is also another 45 minute meditation. And he's got like these shorter ones, like 30 minute ones or 25 minute ones. So depending on time, depending on where I am, and depending on how I'm feeling, I'm usually doing at least one a day. And if I can really get it right, two a day, morning and evening. <laughs> that's powerful hey um i was uh, i was listening to you know yuval no harari and uh, yes, i mean that oak does like two hours a day and then he does 50 day silent retreats which is it's i mean madness. that's insane isn't it <laughs> well you know that's that's a brilliant brilliant example of the fact of getting out of your own way and channeling information and there was a great Instagram quote I saw the other day was anybody who has done anything of real significance has spent many, many months, days, months, hours away from society in solitude in order to be able to come back with that sort of information. You know? So it really is just about not accessing the information, but allowing it to flow. You know? So it's not like you just need this constant flow. And that's why I keep writing books and doing talks because the more I can do it, the more space I have for more information. And I guess he's doing exactly the same, but just on a much grander level. He's got three New York Times bestsellers and his information is densely packaged. This is incredible. I mean, he's changed the world just from his three books, you know? Yeah, hmm. for sure, man. Yeah, I mean, a gay, vegan Israeli. Bless him. How's that? Yeah, eh? yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But I mean, yeah. Jesus. <laughs> Oh, I love it. Yeah. Um, so, but you're a trend and innovation specialist. You call yourself a trenovator, which is just an epic word. Like I, I love, I love the words. Um, you're laughing. Don't you like it? Or are you? No, I made it 10 years ago, you know, <laughs> well, not 10, maybe six or seven years ago. So I kind of <laughs> like trenovator. Yes. I mean, the word I had was trenovate to yeah. use trends in order to innovate. And so then my Facebook said to me, so what's your, what name do you want? So I, I was just messing up the mood. So I was like, oh, Trenovator. And now it's stuck. Now everyone's like, Trenovator. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Stuck. That's right. Cool. Uh, classic, man. So, but um, I'm guessing that a lot of like your research in terms of like futurism and everything else uh, comes from Singularity University, which you're a faculty member of. And it's uh, the, founded by Peter Diamandis now. 
I get um, his emails like once a week yeah, and wow. it's, it's super so fascinating good. the stuff that wow. he, um, so that, that they're working on and, and all these things. And you just kind of, I mean, I personally just get massively excited about <laughs> the future and what's on the horizon, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. But maybe you can just tell us a little bit about uh, what Singularity University is about mm. and um, what it means to be a faculty member of them. So firstly, I must just say, it's not the only place I get my information from. I get my, I get my information from multiple sources so that I have a very um, holistic process of thinking. So as amazing as Peter Diamandis is, there's also other amazing sources of information. You know? So, but Singularity University was founded, I think, around 15 years ago by Ray Kurzweil and Peter Diamandis. They were of the thinking that all universities teach what happened in the past in case studies. And then hopefully you can sort of like figure out what to do when you get to your place, but to your business. But so what they've just decided to do is really just teach the future. And all their faculty members are highly specialized in certain aspects of the future. And I became a faculty member in 2017. And now what happens is you are able to get deployed to different conferences, to different organizations, depending on the needs that they have and what they need spoken about or workshopped about. And so I get deployed from time to time by Singularity, but also just to be involved with a organization that's globally known as one of the world's best think tanks is an incredible privilege, an incredible surprise that I became a faculty member in the first place. Not a surprise, I wanted it, but just not actually surprised the wrong word, just just really privileged and honored to be part of it. And it's been fantastic for my career. Oh, that's cool, man. And, and initially, what attracted you to the whole thing like what 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 was the the spark that got you involved was that was that because you're already thinking in this sort of futuristic way or so i mean i've always been an early adopter in my book i talk about like figuring things out from a very young age and i just didn't know why it was just i was just that's the way i'm built and singularity was an obvious um platform for me to follow if i was really interested in the future and the more i followed them the more i got excited about what they were talking about and then i saw that they had a summit in south africa and I also realized that they could, I could sign up for an ex, a EP, an executive program in San Francisco. So I signed up for it. I got in uh, through some contacts before, because thousands of people apply and only 100 people get accepted mm. into those week-long EPs. Mm. So I maneuvered. I found people in South Africa, one or two people in South Africa that had been. They got me in. And I was there with the CEO of Gucci and the CEO of uh, Walmart South America and mm. some incredible people there, Duke. Decathlon's chairman was there. Wow. Anyway, there was a lot of big, big, big sort of names there. But what really happened is I sat in the summit, the South African summit, and um, I watched the speakers from Singularity. And I thought to myself, I don't know what I was expecting. I thought I was expecting angels with hops to come down because that's <laughs> who I was expecting to see. And what I saw was really good. But then I thought to myself, I'm also pretty much the same as these guys. I'm not that far off. Maybe I need to improve, improve mm -hmm. a bit. So I took my phone out, asked my PA to make a booking or an interview, set up an interview when I was at Singularity for the executive program. They set up an interview and I got accepted. So that's how it yes. kind of like led to it. Amazing, man. Yeah, mm -hmm. you had always had clear goals in your life and what you wanted to do and explore. And you've always been an, an explorer, which is, which is epic. And so just a, bit, a few more things before we move on to your book, because obviously that's like a, a massively a great book and, and super uh, intriguing. But you, you speak globally and um, you, you have a certain outfit, outfit that you generally wear. And um, <laughs> we sort of assume that that's quite intentional. Um, you know, it's so funny. I, I was in ayahuasca. I was in an ayahuasca ceremony many years ago. And she said to me, ayahuasca, she says, why do you still wear school shoes? I was like, what? <laughs> what do you mean? Why do I wear school shoes? It's like, why do you wear leather shoes? We told you you must wear leather shoes. School told you. So why are you still wearing them? I'm like, right. I hate leather shoes. I hate school shoes. They suck. I hate school. So now I must wear the uniform from school, which is kind of still what people are wearing, you know? And so she said, what, why don't you go and wear whatever makes you feel the best? So what's your favorite outfit and just wear that all the time. And I was like, why not? Like, why would you not want to wear your favorite outfit all the time? <laughs> and so, so my favorite outfit's a simple outfit. It's a white shirt with a, uh, I wear, it's called a ghost tie look. So you mm -hmm. just button it up, pair of black pants. I've just gotten a pair of 
new uh, Alexander McQueen trainers. In fact, I don't have any more smart shoes. I've only got Adidas trainers and Alexander McQueen trainers. And now that's all I wear constantly, whenever, and it's the best thing to pack. So what are you, how many days are you going for? Four days, four white shirts. And uh, one, <laughs> it's like the easiest thing. So yeah, it is. And it four is ghost easy. ties. And four ghost ties, of course. The ghost ties go with me everywhere. In fact, I'm wearing one right now. I can't just so, um, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a uniform. And also I've got, I've got uniforms throughout my life now. So even what I'm wearing now, I've got blue jerseys, black jerseys, white t-shirts, and that's it. I just simplified my life. I think what happens is when you, when you like Mark Twain said, when you're born, the two most important days of your life when you're born and when you find out why. And when you find out why, everything else becomes noise, man. It's all noise. You know, I, for me, it's like, how much better can I get at what I'm doing? How much more energy can I put into it? Anything that takes me off that, it's just a waste of time for me, you know? 100%. Yeah. And well, one that, more decision, one more decision to make. Like, you, you just exactly. don't need another. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just don't need it. And it's not important because are you gaining your power from inside or from outside? And if you're really gaining your power from outside, it's really important for you to have the latest Gucci trainers or whatever it is that you're looking for, you know? For me, it just doesn't make it's useless. It's just a useless process because you can never get enough energy from the outside. It's all going to come from the outside, as you know. Yeah, for sure. What you said <laughs> about noise, everything else being noise, is actually the perfect segue into the next question because uh, Gary Vaynerchuk, he talks about 99% of the stuff in, in life is actually n not important and it is just kind yeah. of noise. Um, yeah. But just talking about Gary Vaynerchuk, when we first spoke on our podcast, you said to us that the goal one day is that uh, John Sane comes on as the keynote and Gary V is, uh, is like speaking before you. So how, how far away are we from that, my man? <laughs> yeah, it's so great. Eh? I mean, listen, I'm going to be sharing a stage with Jason Silver soon, which is wow. uh, once per yeah. year. Yeah. So wow. That's happening. Um, you know, I, I know in order to get into that position with a Simon Sinek or a Gary Vee or any of those kind of guys, I need to be much better known in that part of the world. And what's going to get me there faster than anything else is a New York Times bestseller. And so what I've now done, and this has just happened recently, I've in fact partnered with my publisher and said to him, listen, write the book with me. Be a co-author like Stephen Kotler and um, Peter Diamandis were in Abundance and Bold, you know. Be the, let's, let's build a team so we can get to the New York Times bestselling list quicker. So he's on board and he's become a partner in the next book and we've already started writing it. And so for me, it's like, how quickly can I get to that point? How much more light can I hold? How much more um, distinctive can my message become? Um, how much more research can I do? And all of this will add up to eventually getting to that place with uh, being with Gary Vee and, and doing those things. I mean, that guy's got how many? Four or five New York Times bestsellers. And I really don't think the books are that good. I think they're good, mm -hmm. but it's mm -hmm. just his marketing and branding is surreal, man. He's brilliant at that, you know? <laughs> and so I've got some work to do still. So, but thanks. Let's talk again next year and see what happens, where oh, we are. Yes, with yeah. exciting. Great strategy. <laughs> wow. Exciting. Yeah. yeah so, thanks. so um, let's, let's talk about uh, your latest book, uh, Foresight, um, was sparked by a question which you often get <clears throat> after your talks. Mm -hmm. What do I do uh, for my kids? Yeah. And uh, so what do people do for their kids uh, in the future, which, have, which awaits all of us and, and them? And what is your mission with this new book? Yeah, so, you know, you know every time I finish a book, um, I mean, every time I finish a talk, there's obviously parents in the audience and the parents in the audience often say to me, I wish my kid was here. So he could have heard or she could have heard what you just said. So what should we do for them? Because I'm worried. I don't know that, you know, I'm paying incredibly high school fees or incredibly ridiculous university fees for something in preparation that we know is not going to be available or not even necessarily uh, relevant. And so that question kept coming up and, and I found myself answering it more and more in the fact of it's not what you answer. I mean, it's not what you study. It's how you behave. Because what in the past used to be necessary for us was this linear process of study this to do this. But where we move from this industrial life or world into a quantum world, it starts becoming really important for us to be flexible, adaptable, optimistic, and to be able to move between multiple sectors of thinking. And so it's not so much what you must study, but how you must behave. And the more I thought about this, it's almost like what adults need to be doing is like adults are panicking because they're like, should I be studying artificial intelligence? Should I be doing more blockchain? How am I? I don't know. I'm panicking. I'm panicking. I'm like, 
that's not what you should be focusing on. You should be focusing on how do you become a natural adaptive person? How do you let go of your past? How do you become curious about the world you're living in so that you allow a different energy to drive your behaviors? And the linear world was very much based on scarcity. You know, we've, we've got a lot of scarcity in the system. Like credit cards, um, overdrafts, marketing, all these things are scarcity driven. And so we're moving into an abundant world and the quantum world. And we need to change the way we behave. We need to change what makes us most, um, what we define as success. And this all becomes obvious when you start doing the work um, of cultivating wisdom and awakening curiosity within your being. You become a natural optimist, a natural flexible person, a natural adaptive human being. And then now you can start maneuvering into a world that is allowing you to be multifaceted. In fact, it gifts you for being multifaceted instead of linear. So the book was driven about this desire to get people to understand the, not so much the destination, but the behavior. And when you realize that the behavior is really the most important thing, you stop measuring bullshit numbers and it just becomes irrelevant. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, man. But it's, a, it's an amazing book, uh, by the way. So, so thanks so much for sharing it uh, with us, like, like Craig said. And, uh, but uh, you have this amazing way of writing and also putting a book together. And I just kind of love the techniques of how you explain things as well. Um, it really makes it engaging and like very easy to read, which is, I guess, super important. Um, so you talk about uh, four different types of seeing in the book, yeah, uh, yeah. foresight, plain sight, insight, uh, sorry, hindsight, hindsight, plain sight, insight, and foresight. So yeah. maybe you can just uh, explain us sure. what that actually means. So hindsight was very much uh, a result of working with Dojo, the Dr. Joe Dispenza. And uh, he speaks about this a lot is, are you living a life based on a set of memories from your past? Or are you living a life based on the vision of your future? Which is such a powerful statement. And that really got me to think about how so many people in the world are stuck in their past, are creating their now based on their memories and their perspectives of where they come from. And so what we've got to do is realize that the past isn't the way we need to create our future because the more predictable our past, uh, the more familiar our past is, the more predictable our future becomes. And the future doesn't require predictability. It requires brand newness, you know? So that's hindsight. It's like, just let's become aware that hindsight doesn't work. Uh, then we get plain sight. So the people that are the logical thinkers of the world, the people that only believe what their five senses tell them. And so if I can see it, feel it, taste it, touch it, it's real. Um, I need to see it before I can believe it. And we've started to realize that's such an old story because now with quantum science, again, Joe Dispenza, um, biology of belief with Bruce Lipton, it's really believing a seeing, not seeing as believing. It's like we've got to take responsibility for the identity we create, the stories we tell about ourselves and what drives our motivation. But people that are stuck in plain sight are cynics. They're total cynics about the rest of this crap. They don't want to believe any of it. They're so stuck in their stories of the past and where they are right now. And they're really quite clearly victims and pessimists about what's going on. Mm. And then we get people that are stuck in insight. And I think insight's actually the biggest problem we have. Because people who are stuck in insight have got incredibly high levels of knowledge. They have got the PhDs, the masters, the MBAs. They've got all the correct thinking formulation. And these people have also been called the expert problem people, is that they are so expert in a way of thinking that it's very difficult for them to change their behavior or to take any information in that doesn't fit into the same constructs of how they've learned how to think about things. And so what happens is they are highly knowledgeable but have zero wisdom because wisdom is practice knowledge. And so what happens is because they're academically rich, they believe that because they've done all that work, they deserve success. And the fact that mm -hmm. the success in the future doesn't look like what it used to, they're perturbed by this. And so that's, that's insight, highly knowledgeable, no wisdom. And so foresight is really getting us to a point where we can uh, cultivate wisdom and awaken curiosity. In other words, heal our past. As Alan Watts says, the, the knowledgeable man learns something new every day. The wise man unlearns something new every day. Hmm. Uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza calls it having memories with no wisdom. Um, having memories with no triggers, that's wisdom. Uh, yeah. Tony Robbins calls it going from unconscious memories to conscious memories, from blaming your past to thanking your past. Mm -hmm. all, all these teachers have got different languages, but that's what wisdom is. Wisdom is being 
zen, not allowing your past to trigger you. And then curiosity mm -hmm. just really is about making decisions with what makes you most excited, not what's logical and lo also not what's ego driven because logic in the future is not going to get us into the future. The world's not logical. It's not familiar. It's not linear. So when you combine wisdom and curiosity, you've let go of who you were. You are now focused on building the future based on an energy that's excitement that gives you the opportunity to be enthusiastic, innovative, creative, and adaptive because you just flow with this process because nothing's hinged on your back. And now you've got this endless energy that you can access. Hmm. So, so, I mean, that's, that's all, it's pretty fascinating. Now the, the inside, right. I just want to just take it a moment back there. You, you were saying that's kind of the dangerous one. And is that kind of that, that person that you were speaking about just before we got on the show that, you know, every now and then there'll be someone that just doesn't agree with what you're saying on stage. It's like, it happens every now and again. And is it that person usually that that's stuck in insight, that's knowledgeable, but they, but they just, they think they know it all, but they feel resented, resentful because they're hearing that things have to change. And just yeah, before, and just before you, sorry, just before you answer the question, um, are, are the people in insight, do you feel that they maybe lack a bit of emotional intelligence? Is, is that also part of it? Absolutely. They focus everything on their heads, not heart. They disconnected their hearts and they become intellectually um, uh, knowledgeable. And you can tell when people these days are, are intellectually aware, but emotionally asleep. And so they, they've got all the processes and systems and they've analyzed everything and it's detailed and it's so, and they're, they've been so successful and they were so clever before artificial intelligence arrived. But now you have artificial intelligence that does it quicker, faster, cheaper than them than they could ever do because what education taught us was how to think linearly. Because that's what the Industrial Revolution demanded of us. And so now what's happened is that education system is based on the left brain thinking and that is being disrupted. So mm. of course it's difficult. Of course. Of course it's difficult to say, you know, I've had all these privileges because of my degrees and PhDs and now all of a sudden, they don't give me that huge step up based on all the hard work that I've done. So of course it's, it's, it's horrible. And you know, I never had that. So I'm, I'm cool. I'm lucky that my brain is wired naturally for this. I was super cuck at school. I, I was just useless. I, I, my brain doesn't think like that. And so I was never wired for that. So it's just that people that were wired like that and forced themselves to be that good now are, dis are being disrupted and are miserable about the process that it's going on. And, and they can't now want to awaken curiosity. And that, I mean, you get like these old white men in the audience like, what shit are you talking about? What do you mean awaken curiosity? It's like so flowery. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, can, you can call it what you want. You can diss it as much as you want. But as we start moving into the future, adaptability becomes a superpower. Linear mm -hmm. thinking becomes a suicide. So just talking about adapting to change, it, it's really awesome how you basically invite people and, and give them sort of options for the future. And, and some people are, are quite anxious about the future. And, and you've actually written, I believe the best way to overcome our anxiety is to teach ourselves to be excited and energized by change. So I guess that's to do with adaptability too. It, that's curiosity. That, ah. In that sentence is curiosity because, you know, kids – are curious. They, they move and get lost in sand pits and they're just curious. And so what happens with kids? Time disappears. There's just, you know, there's no concept of that. They, you remember you, I'm sure you guys remember, I remember, I would only ever go back home when I was hungry. Like when I was playing with my friends, I would only like, oh shit, oh yeah, I'm, I'm hungry now. Like, okay, let me run home, gobble some food so I can come back and be curious with what's going on around me, whatever I was doing. And so this ability for us to become excited has been innate in us from a very young age. And so society and education and logical thinking has beaten the crap out of our curiosity and said, take your curiosity. You can do it after school for a hobby. But when you come here, we are all going to do algebra together mm. and the same algebra. And it's like, I was used to said it. There was 30% of the class that were brilliant at it. And so they excelled and I failed. Yeah. So, um, it's just, it's, it's just what's happened is that we have to relearn, remember that really curiosity is at the base of us becoming successful in the future.
Yeah, that's for sure, man. And uh, I'm actually doing a talk tomorrow. And one of the things I'm talking about is, is on curiosity. And it's okay. amazing, like, when you kind of start researching certain things about curiosity that like, so many inventions and discoveries were as a result of people being curious and experimenting. And they're experimenting one thing, but they found out another thing. You know, it's, uh, and that's the importance of curiosity, because you actually sometimes never know what you're going to find out. Well, that's brilliant. I love that. But understand something that curiosity doesn't have an end result. Mm. Curiosity is the end result. And yeah. so it's like, no, you know, linear thinking needs an end result. Curiosity gives you this opportunity just to be doing what you love doing all the time anyway. And then the results become magical because of that access. Because yeah. you're opening up that flow. And all of us have a unique signature of curiosity. It's mm. so unique. It's like your signature. It's like your fingerprint. Because your background, your lineage, your grandfather's issues that he didn't heal, that you've had to bring on and heal for him and with him for your lineage and add to that your country you got brought up. I mean, it's just, how do you ever combine? So now what happens is when you're curious and you understand that the curiosity is your signature, you're able to share comfortably because you know nobody else can do it like you can. Yeah. It's impossible. Yeah. But when you're linear in fashion, you commoditized in your thinking. There's other CAs, there's other PhDs, you commoditize. Now what happens? Oh, it's my stuff. Nobody can mm. see it because it's commoditized. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's, I, it's such a unique way of seeing it. And I, it, it makes so much sense though, I must say. Like just the, the uniqueness of your own curiosity, how to think, not what to think. Put those together and you've got a real recipe for, for a fun, exciting time and life. Constantly. It's like a constant yeah. pattern. A lot of people say to me, well, John, are you always happy? I'm like, 95% of the time I am. Why? Because I focus on that and I don't want to be boiled into discussions that de-energize me. I just, I just don't. And, and I avoid them as much as I can. Yeah, exactly. Look, we're only given a certain amount of energy at the start of each day. You know what I mean? Yeah. So use that energy wisely, seriously, like engage in energetic conversations or interesting ones and avoid those ones that you kind of know are going to sort of suck the air out of you. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and a lot of people say, well, I'm surrounded by negativity. I got a message this morning, John, please, can you write a book about, you know, I'm surrounded with negativity. And I said, darling, you are negativity. That's why you're surrounded. <laughs> There's no, I am surrounded. By, I'm not surrounded by negativity. You are. I remember my mother used to say, why does your brother always hang around with the wrong crowd? I said, mommy is the wrong crowd. That's what other mm. parents are saying about him. So it's not about, well, everybody around me is full of shit. I'm not. You're full of shit. That's why you see shit around you. Change your perspective. And then all of a sudden, the circle around you changes. Again, Dr. Jens Ben I'm such a fan. But anyway, he says, your personality creates your personal reality. Obviously. Yeah. Obviously. Uh, it's just, obvious. we forget that every single possibility that's, that is possible is, is there all the time in the, in the universe and yeah. you, you know they all everything is there it's just what you gravitate towards which is within yourself which is what you focus on what you believe you can contain yeah. you know i've also i've done a video about this like the five laws of the universe you know law of intention where we're we going law of action get moving towards it law of attraction vibrate towards it law of allowance which most people don't do because they're so stuck on creating it but the most important law that i think we've never even thought about is the law of receivership is do you think you deserve this Mm. and it's like we don't we're like oh we mm. no no th that's for those people but not mm. me no 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 I'm, I'm okay i'm happy yeah i'm happy i can fly economy i don't mind bullshit you everybody <laughs> business. everybody only some people think they deserve it and then yeah. what happens you deserve it you know that's the sort of thinking that we don't want to take respons responsibility about and one of the major lessons i got out of the last seven day retreat with joe dispenza was Everything that you want in life is determined by how much you love yourself. Because mm. if you are loving yourself to the point of being uh, in a position to receive, then you're in. So those five laws for me, I've been practicing them. Like, okay, so receivership, mm. the container to hold is so important. Mm. Wow. I, I love that one, actually. I've, that's the first time I've, I've heard you speak yeah. about that. So that, that's epic. Um, I was just wondering about uh, a bit more about receivership. So like, are you saying people are like, maybe they, they've got limiting beliefs or whatever, so they're, they're not happy to accept things or, or is, is it kind of along those lines? Well, they don't think they deserve it. 
You know, I had this discussion yeah. with my mom the other day. She's done really well in her life. And I said to her, she's got about 15 staff on her farm and, 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 and she loves her staff and her staff love her. And, they, you know, they've got a really great little family unit going on there on the farm. And, and I said to her, so why don't you have more money? And she said, no, I don't need more. And I was like, okay, let me ask you this. Would you like to put all your farm's kids, mm -hmm. your farm, uh, your team into private school? Yes, mm -hmm. I would. Why don't you have more money? Mm -hmm. She was like, oh, mm -hmm. yes, you're right. Why didn't I bring more money in? It's like mm -hmm. we get to the point where, play humble, boy. Calm down. You don't need more. You're eating so well. You've got so many things. So we kind of like press it down. And I think this is religious upbringing. It's like mm -hmm. a religious thing to be martyr. You don't need a lot. And I don't think you need a lot, but I want the best of whatever I do want, you know? So for me, it's about that receivership is to really understand is, am I adding the value that I think the world wants? Am I accessing myself? Am I doing the work? Am I worthy of these things that I want? And bro, it's, I mean, both bros, it's been happening to me. I mean, you watch, you know, from my Insta and now I'm on <laughs> business class, I'm in lounges, I'm in five-star hotels. And this is a dream. This is not by mistake. This is a architect design reality that I've created for myself based on me thinking I deserve this. You know? I, I, I was wondering, but I can only imagine that you get grief for some of those posts. Like people are going, Oh my God, you're so arrogant now, John, like, yes, sis, uh, you know, you're flying business and you, all you do is you like posting about it and stuff. And, and, and that's all I can think that that's kind of what a lot of people will say. So so two things, that's you, not a lot of people, but that's fine. We can shape it into other people. Um, <laughs> that's, called, that's called the arrogant inferior victim mindset. Anybody who's up there must come below me so I can feel better about myself. And I do that a lot, so you're not alone. I hardly get any messages like that. I can imagine people are perturbed by it and I can imagine people are jealous by it and think that it's unnecessary. Look, the story, see the story, it's unnecessary. But I made a couple posts around me in business class and why it was important for me to share it because I come from Edenvale. I come from a single mom family. I've created this. And guess what? You all can. So I'm going to revel in it to hopefully inspire you, not piss you off. If it's pissing you off, you need to go back and do some more work on yourself. Because if I look at Jay-Z and the way Jay-Z used to look at Lamborghinis and Ferraris when they used to drive past them in New York when he was a crack dealer was I can't wait to be in one. Not who's this wanker I think he is. Yeah. And so Crazy yeah, yeah. was setting himself up the whole time to move into receivership, not break down. And so my life now is in business class. So what must I do is not post. No, I don't know. What must I wait till I'm in economy so I can make sure everybody else is happy with me? <laughs> well, I don't know. I just, I don't even think about it. That's the way I live now. You know what I mean? So that's, and my Instagram stories are my life. So what am I going to share? Yeah, <laughs> but you know what's interesting too. I, I think it was Jay Z and actually Gary V. I don't know if you saw a post recently by him, and it, it made me think of what you were saying now. Like when he was like twenty, you see him with these big gold chains and like bling, and you see him now, and he's just like totally plain, totally comfortable within himself, and yeah. he, he's it's got, he's got this gotten rid of the material wealth because he I don't know it's quite an interesting sort of a concept to think of like that. Well, again, think about the fact that he wasn't rich, and so he wanted yeah. to show him create a perception of it. And then when he became truly rich, he had nobody to, what does he want to tell anybody for? And so yeah. he's now, if he does share a story, it's in his Maybach. He's not sharing his Maybach. He's not showing, like, that's where he sits. What does he do? So for yeah. me, it's about, it's not about being blingy. It's about being authentic. Yeah. And I think people will say it as much as the next guys. It's available to everybody. People just don't think it's available to them because it's for the other people, not for them. You know, and, but, and I think also just, sorry, sorry, I thought you were finished there. Carry on. No, 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 I'm done. I was, I was just going to say also, well, before you move on from the receivership, you actually said something earlier and made me think about it. Like if you give freely, your, your, um, your hand is open when you, but so just as much as you are giving, you can receive. So does that, that also plays into it? Absolutely. I mean, I think the, the, the energy of abundance is two way. It's a two way street. You know, you're giving comfortably and you're receiving comfortably. Mm. And because you're not putting money on a pedestal, then you are able to access it. And because people who are not abundant in their thinking, put money, not on a, put it on a pedestal. So it's scarce. And so what they call mm. things is expensive. And the minute you say something's expensive and scarce, you put it 
up here. So what do you do with something that's up there? You use it very sparingly because there's not enough of it. And so the minute mm. you go, ah, I'm on the same level as money. Uh, there's more than enough for me to share. Let me give somebody a bit more. And you know what? I didn't really, wasn't really happy with your work, but uh, you know what? I know you need to live. Here's some more. And I know it with my domestic lady. I give her three times more than any one of her other employees give her. And that's because I've got money. And for her, those extra few hundred rands means the absolute world to me. I mean, to her. And what it does for me, to her, my relationship with her, just changes it dramatically. And then I turn around and I get booked in Budapest that pays me thousands and thousands of dollars to go and talk there. I mean, so, mm. of course, it's the, it's, the, it's the nuance of how we position money in our perspective and mm. how we're able to not put it up onto a pedestal and not disrespect it either, but see it as an equal and an enabler. I think that's a super important lesson in there. Like, um, first of all, about what you're talking about is paying the lady that uh, helps you, you know, to, to look after your house and stuff, like paying them extra. Like I always think like, if you can afford to do that, you must really always do that because that empowers them. It gives them more worth. You know what I mean? And, and like you said, the, the sort of kickback, uh, in a way is like she now she's like I'm always going to work for John because he looks yeah. after me and it just enhances that relationship totally and I do it with my whole team you know yeah. I've got eight or nine people around me and every single one of them I give them more than they expect I bonus them when they're surprised when they're not expecting it yeah. and really what you're doing is you're buying genuine authentic um, relationship both with them and with money and that's the real key there is that they see somebody being so generous to them. It gets them to think of where they are not generous, changes their relationship with money, and then gets me to have a much more fluid relationship with them because money is never the issue to discuss. Let's just make sure we've all got our expenses paid and we've got money for holidays and we can buy nice clothes and buy food, whatever, and now let's start working. And so mm. really for me, it's about how do we go about giving more than it's expected so that that lesson becomes one for you, two for them and three with money. Hmm. Something that, uh, that uh, Gary V talks about a lot um, is how he manages his company and specifically the employees. And as a CEO, he has a thousand people that work at the company. And he always says that he has, he works for those thousand people and that's a, that's a really great concept. And like, I think that's kind of the future of organizations. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, listen, I think he's got a giant business and I think it's doing incredible things. For me, I'm working with my people. I'm not working for anybody and nobody's working for me. And I understand what he's saying, but I don't mm. see it like, I see it much more in the process of how can I be a better version of myself? How can I inspire people around me to be the best versions of themselves because ultimately when you hang around people what are you actually doing when you're speaking to them you're either seeing the best version of themselves or you're looking for crap within them and so mm -hmm. the only way you can see the best versions of other people is when you see the best version of yourself and so when I'm working with people around me they are seeing opportunities within themselves they never saw because I am seeing that aspect of them based on me seeing that aspect in me so the teams around me, I don't work for anybody. I think it's an it's a, it's a upward spiral of energy of working together to want to build something. But then again, I've only got eight people, not a thousand. So maybe when I got a thousand, <laughs> not that I want a thousand, but if I ever have a thousand, maybe I'll have the same message as Gary. I, I, not right now, though. Oh, that's cool. Man. Um, yeah, working with people is super important. And um, just, just moving back onto the book. So uh, one of the things that you, you talk about is Infotech. And uh, there's two game changing upgrades. And actually, there's a lot of talk around one of them right now, especially in the UK and Europe, and people are flipping so worried about it. But uh, one of them is 5G and yes. Protocol 6. So, so what do these two things actually mean for us? Well, firstly, before I, before I tell you about them, we all panic when things arrive when we don't know what they are. Remember Y2K? Yeah. Panic. Yeah. I mean, people are going to die. I mean, it was just killing everybody. And then there was like all sorts of things about infrared and what it's doing to our brains and then this. And, and I'm not saying they don't do anything to us. Like, let's, let's, let's bank that. But the first thing people do is panic. That's the first thing they do because it's new, because it's fresh, because they're stuck in hindsight and they're not really thinking about what's coming. But I don't know the danger specifically of 5G. I mean, obviously, I've seen the same stuff you guys have seen on social media, which can be really rubbish, like birds fell out the sky and died in Holland. 
but then they had all but the other stories of why those birds died. So we don't know exactly. But for me, 5G is really going to be changing the notion of connectivity like we've never really understood before. It's going to give us the first opportunity to have true life autonomous, autonomy cars, autonomous cars and planes where we've never had that opportunity with the lack of guaranteed connectivity. And because it's much smaller areas of influence and we have to have many of them, um, it gives us this continuous connectivity, which I think Will not. I don't think we quite understand, and I don't really understand the repercussions of speeds of a hundred times faster. I don't think we quite understand yet what it's going to do to us. But it's coming. Whether you want it or not, come. You're going to be bringing it, and I'm sure that a lot of people never wanted to leave a BlackBerry, and then eventually they're on an iPhone. It's the same thing. It's just going to be an involvement, and then Internet Protocol Six is the ability for us now to have this new platform. It's not new, it's a few years old, but it gives us this opportunity to connect 78 octillion devices to the internet, that 78 billion, billion, billion things can have their own IP address and create an intelligent communication between each other with 5G, which gives them this opportunity for connectivity nonstop at incredible speeds. It's, it's, almost, it's almost impossible to imagine, do you know what I mean? It like, is, yeah. it, is. Like, it is, and I say this often, but do you understand? The future is not about understanding the future. It's about understanding our behavior for the future. Yeah. You see the okay. difference? It's, yeah. it's not being skeptical. What are we going to do with 5G? No, no, wait, don't worry. Just be adaptive. Just yeah. go with it and see where it leads you. Have the conversations with those people so that we can all move towards something that's, um, that, that's new and fresh for everybody. But your behavior while you approach it is everything rather mm. than being panicked. Yeah, totally. I, There's I so much... No. No, I always think that like sci-fi movies are actually like, um, they're actually yeah. just preparing us for the future. You know what I mean? Like these are like, you look at them and you're like, oh my God, this will never happen. Like, so for example, Total Recall. I mean, yeah. you know, all I'm thinking now, but what you're saying now is I'm thinking, wow, this is Total Recall. It's going to sort of be happening in the future. And all these yeah. sci-fi movies are, mm. yeah, just kind of like subconsciously preparing us for, for what's going to happen. Well, I mean, if you think about Inception, one of the smartest movies that I mm. think ever was made, this idea of a dream within a dream within a dream within a dream, and what we are as conscious human beings is only seeing a layering of this dream. You do ayahuasca, you do any of these other things, you, you get an opportunity to see another parallel dimension, another sort of reality, and you start to realize that we are within dreams within dreams within dreams within dreams. And so when you're talking about that total recall and if we're in it or we're not in it, I don't think we quite understand the extensiveness of limitless parallel universes that are around us. <laughs> I mean, can you even, you can't conceive it with this mind. It's almost like it doesn't make sense, you know? So I think this awakening gives us this opportunity to look at this reality, not from a logical mind, but from our heart. And this is the sort of subconscious space, which Malcolm Gladwell wrote about in Blink many years ago. These are the things that are starting to become more common practice and more commonly discussed uh, openly. Yeah. And how, it's, open it's, is, how open is your mind? Sorry, Craig. How open is your mind? Like, is it, you know, things like UFOs, is that stuff that you like, oh yeah, this, that's a possibility that it's out there sort of thing? Well, I, without sounding like an absolute crazy person, I listened to a guy called Bashar who is a alien from a planet called Essasani. Yes. I only and, heard about uh, him like two days ago. Yeah. Yeah. I've been listening to him for years An <laughs> incredible wealth of information. And, and what he is, I mean, I mean, it sounds weird. I know it sounds weird, but he's a fifth. He's, he's from the fifth dimension. He's 700 years ahead in the future. If we believe in linear thinking, he's from a planet called Essasani. He's family or they don't actually have family constructs like we do, but he's a first contact specialist. So he comes into civilizations to help them raise their vibration so they can have real interaction. So right now, he's just channeling through a guy called Daryl Anker, and he's in very detail of all the um, sort of terrestrial um, bloodlines and how they're formed and matched and how the humans arrive and what DNA was used and sort of where we're going and what we're doing. And so, yes, of course, I believe in that stuff. Because if you think about the very thin sliver of reality that we get access to because of our five senses, you'd be ridiculously, you'd be stupid if you thought that was it, you know? And that's what, that's what plain sight is. Hmm. People are stuck in plain sight. They're like, 
whatever, concert, but shut up. Like, dude, what are you thinking? Like, how arrogant are you to think that this, and you know, if you take mushrooms or if you take any of these things, you look at grass and you're like, oh my God, how green is that grass? Why is it always that green? Because our perspective just gives us access to those range of colors. Now, yeah. all of a sudden, we have a range of more colors. We're like, where do these colors come from? But actually, they're all there. We just have the slitters. So absolutely, I believe in aliens, without a doubt. Yes, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, was, there was a podcast recently. Um, uh, Joe Rogan, he spoke to a guy called Bob Lazar. And uh, mm. yes, man, he was talking about Area 51 and all these things. And it really like, got me thinking. It was an like, incredible podcast. Well, Bashar also says that there's lots of aliens around, but they are not from this dimension. So you can't see them, mm. but they're here. They're like kind of like, like almost like in touching distance, but because we haven't done the work and we haven't vibrated. Remember when I said to you, when I left the Joe Dispenza meditation retreat, I could look at people and see their lives, which is the most surreal thing for me. But I'd walk past somebody. I'm like, I could tell you all about them. Whether it was real or not, I don't know. But I had a clear sense about what, is, what was going on in their lives. And think about increasing your vibration, increasing your vibration, increasing, and then what else do you see? How much more is there that we don't have access to right now? So yes, I think they are around. I think they are, but from our perspective, we find it difficult to understand, believe, and see. And what you were saying earlier, there was another thing we watched recently about um, the like latest theories in within the scientific world. You know, string theory is kind of being pushed a little bit aside, and they're looking for the grand unified theory of, of everything in the universe. And and they come up with this like eight D sort of um, crystalline universe which is it's it's this most incredible theory but part of that theory and it, when i read your book it made me think of it as like um there time is in this weird loop there is actually no forward and backwards so when you talk about in your book about healing the past you when you're doing that you actually simultaneously according to the latest science like this is you're actually healing the future of course and because it happens together. And it's like, it blew my mind when I was like, well, that, that you, it <laughs> makes so much sense when you do like inner child work or something like that. Yeah. It's good because you're actually going forward and backward at the same time, which is kind of mind blowing. But, it's it's mind -blowing because, but, but understand that our linear minds can't make sense of it. No, It's a linear thinking process that we're unlearning right now. And so what are you made up of? You're made up of memories. And so if you're made up of memories, heal them. Make them all cool so that when you're made up and when you're sitting here, you don't have any resentment and anger and frustration with what's going on in your past. And all of a sudden, your future looks different. Why? Because your past changed. And so we still call it past and future, but really it's like, I don't know, the forever now just will be yeah. uh, uh, um, uh, experienced differently because yeah. of you healing that stuff you know so that's why for me when i talk about the future i'm like before we talk about the future guys it's not, not so much about the future which i think is still amazing to look at but if you don't have the right psychology and consciousness mm -hmm. and awareness of course it's scary of course like why wouldn't it be i, I would also be scared but do this yeah. and it becomes friendly hmm. and just speaking about uh, like minority report and these kinds of things that you were talking about uh, you you speak about biotech as well um mm. and things like CRISPR, which is is you know going to be I'm really incredible well. yeah. and mm. is going to be able to you know have healthy bay with supernatural side intelligence and, and a whole bunch of other potential things beyond just uh mm. nice blue eyes or whatever but um mm. but uh we also do you think that we sort of dabbling uh, maybe too far with genetics, or do you just think it's inevitable that, that things are need to go this way? Yeah, good question. I, I, I think we have to think about when medicine arrived, do you think people were asking the question the same way? It's like, are we playing God now, extending people's mm -hmm. lives? Shouldn't they just die when they're supposed to die? Now we're we giving them antibiotics. Is that surely that's playing God and determining mm -hmm. how healthy they are? And if we think about how life was only around you were living to about 38 years old in the turn of the 19th century. Now we're at 78 and that's moving to 160. So we've been gradually playing more God anyway. And this is just an exponential addition to it. And so I think it's a natural extension of us human beings being wanting to be better. And so whether we're doing it based on anxiety, excitement, it's fine. We still want to be better. 
And so this is just the most exciting part of the future for me, the most um, shifting and changing dynamic for us as biotech is understanding the technology behind the biology that makes us food and pretty much anything else around us. And when we can start toying with that, and already we are, because if you had to go get a heart transplant or you put a, a, one of those things into your heart, what are you doing? You're putting a part of a robot in it. That's just becoming more and more intelligent. And I often tell my audience members, because I can see the shock in my audience members when I say that to them. And I said, let me ask you a question is, if your child lost its sight, would you put cyborg eyes into its eyes? And the answer is absolutely I would. And then the next question is when your son or daughter is looking at something and then doesn't need binoculars to keep zooming in to the ship onto the ocean and you're sitting there like a blind bat and you think to yourself, hang on a second, I need new eyes. I know, how much are they now? They're $9,000. Okay, I'm going to go get new eyes. Because I mean, why would you? Like, like, <laughs> we would all do it. And we would all do it. And it'll be a natural thing that we all become very used to. Yeah. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. I guess um, what some people fear is that people that are wealthy tend to receive these things like maybe intelligence, et cetera, through the splicing of the genes, blah, blah, first. And then you get this sort of bifurcation happening. Um, and, but, but when, when you say it like that, I mean, medicine could be seen the same way. Wealthier yeah, people would get medicine first and blah, blah, blah. I see what you mean. Yeah. I, I was going to say that I was waiting for you to finish it. That's been the, that's always been the constant Yeah. because yeah. richer people ate better in the 1400s. And so the poorer people died of starvation. Today, it's just, I'm gonna see further than the poorer people. But also what we have on our sides, which you mustn't discount, is the zero marginal cost society that technology gives us. Everything is becoming cheaper and more accessible to more people more often at bigger speeds than ever before. The middle class has never been bigger and it's growing faster than ever before. We all have more access to more um, nutrients in our diet than ever before. And that goes right and keeps going. So yes, the rich will always have that access and the mm. poor won't. But think about what the rich are. The rich are people that believe they deserve the receivership of what they get. And poor people don't believe they deserve it. That is as simple as it is. And the shift in money consciousness goes from I don't deserve it to I deserve it. Interesting, man. And just talking about like, you know, biotech and things that are happening there. One of the things I've been listening to lately is around longevity. And uh, I think it's super exciting. There's a lot of like research and stuff going on already where, you know, people are going to be living to kind of 200 or even beyond. Yeah. yeah. What, are your, what are your thoughts on that? Or what's your, you know, what do you have to share on that? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that uh, we have the opportunity, the potential right now, not only just with CRISPR-Cas9 and all these other stuff, but just look at how we're understanding food and nutrients and microbiomes. And we still haven't even started doing using edibles. And when we start putting edibles, and I'm not talking marijuana edibles, because sort of some parts of the world call edible, but I'm talking about IOT, beacons. When we start making them edibles and we start swallowing them and we can create miniature viruses that can be programmed to fix us and we can swallow those as well, I mean, it's just, I, I, have, I don't think anybody can tell you exactly what age, but I think the average age is going way beyond 100 and will do because it becomes obvious because we are now able to understand much more. And I think it was Ray Kurzweil, I was watching one of his talks and he said, the most dangerous thing in the future would be to fall off a building or to hurt yourself physically and mm -hmm. die because medication and genomes and those sort of things, you're never going to die from that stuff. You're going to start dying from, so the most dangerous thing most probably would be a bungee jump in the future. I mean, that'd be like, Oh my God, you know, like autonomous vehicles and planes, you'll never die because everything's so safe. All of that stuff will fall out the wayside and the most dangerous thing would be something could physically kill you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> crazy, man. Crazy, isn't it? Um, so, but just something practical maybe you can uh, help, uh, you know, people with is you talk about unlearning, but like, how can you unlearn? What is your, do you have any tools or ideas around that? Well, I think unlearning comes down to the process of are you following your memories or are you following your vision? And if you are starting to follow your memories uh, more and more, you're still following the old ways of thinking. And unlearning is not so much unlearning. It's a refocusing of your energy towards your future, not your past. And the only way you can forget about your past is by healing it. And so that's unlearning. You're unlearning your behavior patterning. 
the behavior patterning that you don't even know you're following based on the memories that you have. Mm. And so the unlearning is not a process of unlearning. It's about refocusing and healing. And so that becomes a natural process of having the opportunity and space to bring you in because now you've cleared your past. Mm. Cool. Cheers. And that, yeah, that just leaves so much space for, for growth. Now, just talking more other practical things you mentioned a moment ago, the biotech, like autonomous vehicles, are obviously, uh, you know, spoken a lot about it currently. And, but I think there's so much more scope than we probably realize there. Um, it's pretty exciting times, isn't it? Mm. So, I mean, my, my first, so I, just to let everybody know, the book is made up of 20 essays, uh, 10 of which are focused on the future and 10 of which are focused on consciousness and awareness. And so I've mixed them up. So one, number one is on autonomous vehicles. Number two is on language. Number three is on gold. So I go through the future and psychology between them. And one of the essays I've started off with is how autonomous vehicles will not only change the way you get from point A to point B, but will change where point A and point B are. Mm. And for me, it was a fascinating piece of research because if we think about how we as human beings started living many, many years ago, we started off in caves and then we started having buildings and these buildings would only reach sort of the third floor because nobody wanted to walk up more than three flights of floors or stairs. And the cheapest um, space on that three story building was the attic. The poorest people used to live on the top floor. The richest people used to live on the bottom floor. And in the 1800s, Otis developed a braking system that gave us the opportunity to have an elevator. And all of a sudden, what we had was a vehicle that had a driver that would move us vertically from point one to point 12. And so what happened is that this um, uh, driven vehicle changed the price of property and made the most expensive price of property the top one and the cheapest one the bottom one. Then the elevator became autonomous. So the world's first autonomous vehicle is actually an elevator. And now we have... 150 floors that the top floor is the most expensive because this vehicle is now autonomous and makes the process very easy to get to. Now, if you just take the process of autonomous vehicles going upwards and instead of making it a vertical process, make it a horizontal process. Now, all of a sudden, the prices of properties away from the city centers will become more expensive because that's the way it's going to be because we don't need to be all crammed together on top of each other at, in, the op, in, in, in the city because we don't want to be transporting ourselves. And that autonomous vehicle, we don't even know the things that will be available for us to do. I would imagine you'd be sitting in your lounge and the, and the autonomous vehicle will almost come in and scoop you up and keep you moving. So you would must really keep going with exactly what's happening. You would not even feel like you've moved because you must probably have magic leap steps on with some sort of augmented reality or virtual reality happening around you. You won't even know you've left point A to point B to get to your meetings. So the process of autonomous vehicles will change the price of property just like they did when they were an elevator. <laughs> I love that, but And you know what's so funny? Like I actually, I mentioned this and I wrote this like probably like a couple of years ago and um, uh, yeah, geez, people just flip and gave me grief for saying the exact thing about that, you know, um, people will move more out of cities and, and like it'll become less expensive in the cities and all these things and how, you know, it'll affect house prices and whatnot. But like you said, it's probably that plain sight or inside thinking, which kind of stops people from, <laughs> from looking that way. Yeah, I, mean, I, think, I think a lot of the times when, people, when things don't stick or, or fit into the framework of which you've always been taught to think, of course they're uncomfortable. That's just yeah. what happens. You know, we, we, we get that often uh, yeah. from people, not just, they just feel frustrated about it, you know? Yeah. yeah, for sure, man. And, but look, you're an extremely articulate guy, right? And I, I really love how you talk and it's, it's really fascinating seeing the evolution of the way you speak and the way you convey your message as well. And um, you do it elegantly and beautifully. And I love how you always use the word elegantly. I think it's such a great uh, and charming word. Um, now, one of the things you actually speak about, though, is communication as well. And kind of like there, there's still such an important emphasis on communication in the future and now. So can you just maybe talk a bit more about that? So I, th- I, I, th- I think it's, it, it's, it's the, the way I see the, the, the future requires us to connect still with other human beings. And we see this happening in retail mostly is that um, I did some work with the Abu Dhabi government uh, on the future of retail. I called that workshop and keynotes, uh, the end of the middle. And the end of the middle really shows us a distinctive way of understanding how human beings need states are changing. 
So the way I describe it there is that 80 to 90% of our money that we spend is always spent on the everyday things, you know, from aftershave to, I mean, not aftershave, shaving cream to uh, dishwashing liquid, nappies, these crappy things that we used to look forward to going to a shopping center to do. Now it is our absolute worst thing that we want to do. None of us want to go and do any of those things. And so what's starting to happen is that all those things are being sent to us by Amazon, Alibaba, and the likes in whatever country you are. And so that whole 80% of our money that we're spending, we don't want to go get it all, but we want it sent to us. But this becomes a huge problem because now we don't have the connectivity with other people. We don't have the communication. And so we yearn for a sense of community. And so retail is moving away from massive shopping centers to become massive warehouses to be able to send you these things based on algorithms and based on all these artificial intelligence processes. And then what we're going to start moving towards is these much smaller nodes of community where you can go and meet your barista, your baker, and your candlestick maker. And in this process, what happens is you create this community based on your very myopic, I'm not myopic, but very small, close community. So you can still have this communication and interaction with massive levels of efficiency around you. So we almost like going to a place of slow food is great. I want to know where my beans come from, but everything else in my life, just get it sent to me. I don't care as long as it does not have any harm on anything else. So just send it to me. <laughs> so I think communication is evolving and you can even see where Bumble the Tinder competitor created these sort of real life bars, Bumble bars. So now what happens when you meet somebody, you can go meet them at a Bumble bar quite quickly so that you have this high touch, high tech sort of um, connectivity. And I think we have kind of thought that high tech was enough. And we all kind of like thought if you, as long as you have an online presence and if you have a retail store online, you sort it. And actually, no, we've realized that no, it's not actually enough. We need high touch, high tech. We need massive levels of efficiency, but let, still crave community and human connection. That's not going away. If you've got a virtual reality world though, and with, with sort of haptics and, and all sorts of interesting things, does that, does that negate that need or, or does that fulfill that need? So remember that, well, not remember, but if you look at Fortnite, for example, there's this big sense of community there. It might not be person to person, but everybody that's playing Fortnite is playing with friends from around the world that they never actually would have seen otherwise. There's a sense of community there, but you're very right. I mean, with artificial intelligence and by 2029, they reckon that you won't tell the difference with the, if you're speaking to a computer or a human being and your best friend will most probably be Siri yeah, over the next 10 years. You know? And so I don't know, you know, I, 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 yeah. I, I, right now is what I'm saying for the next 10 years, we are mm. craving barista, baker, and candlestick maker. I have it. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure you have it. You know where yeah. you go for a coffee. The guy greets you. You know, you know where you get your bread from. You know the market that you go to. Um, when the virtual reality world, will that change? I'm sure it will. How it will change? I don't know to the extent that it will be changed. Um, it'll be a sad place if, uh, look, I'm sounding like a person stuck in hindsight. Did you just hear what I just said? It's bad. Yeah, yeah. If we lose that community, I mean, yeah, but I, mean, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's what's going to be happening in the future. I'm not sure. I just it's sound fascinating. Like a yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, talking about jobs in the future, and it sounds like maybe opening up a recycling plant is uh, one of the ways forward, isn't it? Are you talking about gold, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, what a fascinating piece of research that was. I mean, I got it from uh, Dave Roberts from Singularity University. I was watching one of his talks and then I dived much deeper into the topic. But what blew me away was industries that don't think they'll be disrupted. The ones that you really can never think about how they would get disrupted are being disrupted. And this one is based on gold mines being disrupted. And the, the stats are just mind-blowing. 33% of all gold and silver mined around the world is for electronics. In fact, they say there's more precious metals in circulation right now in electronics than there are still left in Earth. Mm -hmm. If you understand that there's a, million, a billion cell phones being sold every year right now, and we are set to see that increase still, um, and you understand the amount of e-waste that we create as humans, that some of it is put together into a sort of, um, a, there's a city in China called Gyu that receives 4,000 tons of electronic e-waste or e-waste every hour and what they've started to realize that for every ton of cell phones you have to actually mine 70 tons of gold ore and you can recycle a, um, a ton of cell phones much cheaper 
than you can 70 tons of gold ore. And so now the new gold mine is a pile of old computers. And so now all of a sudden the focus has moved in on this is where, you, can you think that a little town in China is going to become the number one gold producer in the world? Like what? Mm. Like how did that happen? There's no resources in the ground. Now they've just set up the system that they are the number one gold producer in the world. Jeez. Mad. But yeah, so if you think your industry is undisruptible, yeah, you've got another thing coming because we're all going to get disrupted. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Tell me about it. But talking about disruption, it's like, you know, it's kind of happening left, right and center. And so many businesses are, are not seeing it. And I, I love the example that you wrote in the book about Dollar Shave Club. I actually remember watching that literally, I think it was like six years ago or something. Yeah. And they, they paid like $5,000 for that video, that original video. Yeah. And now look at them. I mean, they sold for a billion or something, didn't they? Dollars, yeah. Yeah. Insane. So, so, so one of the things is we've got it. We can't get caught up in the innovation loop, which I think was necessary in the 90s and early 2000s. And innovation is just what you did yesterday, but better. Uh, Gillette being the worst example of it or the best example of it. One blade, two blade, three blade, four blade, five blade, six blade, seven blade. I mean, what do you, what's next? Ten blades? I mean, how many blades are you going to still bring it out? <laughs> and so that's not necessary in the world we're moving into. And then so now the next thing we're focusing on today is disruption, which means making your current business model obsolete so you can build a brand new business model, which is what's happening right now. But what where we're going is very, very different. Where we're going is a revolution, an evolution of human beings that measure success differently. And the more I interview these new tech startup CEOs, you'll realize they are much more about impact than they are about profit. And because now you're competing a boardroom of old white men who are only in deck measuring contests about their balance sheet, and now you're competing against people that actually don't have the legacy costs don't have the same drivers and motivators, which is used to be safety and security, and now it's flexibility and impact and creativity. You can't compete. You're actually competing in totally different games. And these people are going to win because they're about the people and community and collaboration. These people are about exclusion and profitability. And so these are dying. And this is why it's uncomfortable for them. And the biggest star that we have right now showing us this in absolute moment by moment reality is Elon Musk. And when he came out on the 22nd of April to tell the world that he is now going to be competing against Lyft and Uber was the most incredible piece of news because they said to him, well, how are you going to compete against them when they've got so many cars on the road? He says, well, I've already got a million robo taxis on the road. And I said, what do you mean? He says, well, every Tesla that I've sold up to now is a potential robo taxi. So if you own a Tesla, you can put your car into the pool and earn up to $30,000, if not more, every year. While you're sleeping, while you're working, your car can be earning your money. But here's the real magic. And this is why he's a revolutionary, not even a businessman. Because Uber and Lyft charges $3 a mile. He's charging 18 cents a mile. <sighs> we think about that. That's not even in the same category. Mm. It's like, I'm giving you a better experience, a safer experience, a less carbon heavy experience for multiples cheaper multiples <laughs> not even just like um, it's not 20 percent cheaper or 50 percent cheaper it's multiples different so now understand elon musk's driver is it profit it's not no. is it wall street dick measuring contest it's not it's just he's wired differently and now take him and go down into the late 20s early 30s even the teens and speak to them and ask them what they want to do when they, in, in, when they grow up and how do they want to create a world in the future. And their drivers are different. And so innovation was enough. Disruption is right now currently our focus, but the evolution is coming. And that's why we need to evolve ourselves so we understand this evolution so we don't keep getting depressed because people here are not measuring success in the same way. Mm -hmm. I was watching a thing recently, actually listening to one, and, and they were talking about a lot of people giving Elon Musk not liking his thoughts. And I, and I almost couldn't fathom that. I was like, no, that can't, that can't be right. So I kind of went down the rabbit hole and a lot of people don't like Elon Musk. And I was, this was like a massive shock to me actually. And is it just because they can't, is it the same thing of like, they just can't fathom or, or they are scared? Like, well, why do you think that is? Well, if you think about what happened with the wall street, they had a fight with wall street investors. Right. And, what was going on is, uh, this is from my perspective, what was going on yeah. there was 
He wasn't able to get the production out quick enough. He wasn't able to give the cars quickly enough to the people. And so his battery pack production line wasn't ramping up quick enough. And so they were pushing him to get it going and he kept moving it quicker and quicker and quicker. But what happened about two years ago was Puerto Rico had that huge storm and they had no power. The whole island had no power for I don't know how long. So they asked Elon Musk to help them. And he quietly started diverting power back batteries to Puerto Rico. And it leaked that he was doing it. And the leak actually says he was caught doing it from last fall. And he was actually taking away production capacity from his I3s. And this really pissed off Wall Street. Hmm. And so anybody who's measuring success in the old way will see him as somebody who's really just irritating them because he's not seeing the world the way they see the world. So these people that don't like him are stuck in plain sight and insight. He mm-hmm. couldn't give a sod. He's moving. He's going to go and do things, you know, and he's creating super fans along the way. He's changing the sales of cars around the world. And just uh, Peter Diamandis' blog just the other day was, we have reached peak, consum- uh, peak combustion engine sales. We did last year. 2018 was the peak. Mm. And now we're starting to see e-cars take over. We've got the e-Formula One now going. We've got e-this, e. Everything's moving towards e. And obviously, the, we're still utilizing coal too much for it. But that's also being solved by him with his tiles and with all that other things that are coming. So I think the people that don't like him are really the ones that are stuck in plain sight or hindsight. Sure. Jeez. Now, I'd like to just bring it back briefly, just a slightly more personal part of, of yourself in the book as well, briefly. Um, you write about forgiveness and, and obviously dealing with your past, and we've spoken briefly about that now. But um, something you've had to face, uh, well, it is something that you've had to sort of face uh, with your own relationship with your dad, isn't it? Yeah, you know, I, I, I write about this a lot. I speak about it a lot. Is that we, have a, we have board members around the world that never got acknowledgement from their fathers. And we have a lot of teenagers stuck in men's bodies. And because of the lack of acknowledgement that we never receive from the alpha males in our lives, we are desperately seeking acknowledgement everywhere. And this process is seen in the ridiculous notions we have on ruining the earth in every possible way so that our egos can feel better about the jacket we're wearing or the leather bag that we have or whatever the case may be. This is all ego-based things based on the lack of acknowledgement. And so I have had to heal this process within myself because I myself was desperate for acknowledgement and attracted all sorts of alpha males into my life that were incredibly abusive from a very young age, not realizing that desperation for anything brings about abuse and just nastiness. And so for me, forgiving my father, not so much forgiving my father, but accepting my father to the point where I understand that he's just not perfect, one, two, he just hasn't done the work. Three, I don't think he knows how to do the work. I think he's just wired this way. And in that generation, they were never gifted or celebrated for becoming emotionally aware. They were gifted and celebrated for putting a family uh, through school and feeding them for 25 years. You know, So we have to go through a process of this incredible gift we can give ourselves is to release people based on the expectations of what we had. And as boys or as men, our fathers play such a crucial role in this process of either getting us to be acknowledged or not acknowledged. And we're now realizing the importance of it. But, you know, bless them. They had no idea. And so I don't think my dad was malicious in the process, but I think he was so caught up in his own triggers, shadows, and psychological issues that he never even thought about that, you know, uh, hitting us or not giving us acknowledgement was okay. And it wasn't okay. It's never mm-hmm. okay. Mm-hmm. And is your dad, is he still around? Yes. Um, I, he lives in Iran. Um, I, I've, I've decided not to engage with him because I think it's one thing to forgive and it's another thing to engage. And you don't have to engage once you've forgiven. It's just a, it's an emotional sense. Now that I'm speaking to you about it, I'm not angry with him. I used to be very angry with him. I'm not angry, mm-hmm. but I just don't also need to be best friends with the guy. You know what I mean? So, yeah. you know, if, if, if somebody killed your brother, you can forgive them, but you don't have to hang around with them. You don't have to be their friend, you know? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, he's around and um, living his life. Yeah. Does he ever, like, try and get in touch with you or anything like that? Because you now, I guess, uh, like, have an elevated status and stuff? 
Yeah, he does. Um, I don't think he does it for that elevated status. I think he just does because he wants to reach out. But we, every time we try and connect, we are from different places in the world, vibrationally. You know, he's, he's, uh, he's stuck in his old ways of thinking. And, um, you know, again, it's the old white man principle. You know, they're just stuck. They just I want to move out of it and, and, and are frustrated with the fact that uh, the world is not like it used to be. Mm-hmm. yeah yeah and that's why we have so much nationalism around the world what's going on with yeah. that you know it's like these mm-hmm. old people that have got some memory based on some fantastical past that was a fantasy they almost think yeah. it was perfect it was never perfect mm-hmm. but because right now there's so much going on there's so much options and choice and things are changing so rapidly all they're doing is out of fear is going back to where they came from so kick everybody out that's getting our jobs kick let's just go back to where you used to come from and this is the same scenario where I guess that generation kind of suffers from. Hmm. Yeah, for sure. So, so also you talk about doing business elegantly and there's that word again, which I think is a, is a great word and, and, but it sounds very profound, you know, doing business elegantly. What does that actually mean? I think it's another way of talking about conscious capitalism. It's really about measuring success in long term and on impact. And for me, it's like, just like we were talking about earlier, you know, paying your people around you more than they expect. That's elegant. It's paying people before they've sent the invoice. It's elegant. It's telling somebody, um, I don't, I think you should be charging more for what you're doing because I think you're really good. That's elegant. It's not short-sighted. It's never wanting to negotiate because when you understand that you're creating abundance around you and money is an energy form, why do you need to negotiate with anybody? Give that person fair wage and give them more. And so there's a couple of tools that I've kind of seen businesses that are elegant. And one of them is they move from communication to connection. They stop talking, they start listening. And there's a whole bunch of different examples around that. You know, They move from measuring success to measuring significance the way they go about doing this is, is very different. And I've got some other sort of steps that I can't actually remember right now, but there are other steps that I've seen businesses led by elegant leaders who have done the work and the way they approach business is one of elegance. There's no actually other way to want to describe it. And I think there's a lot of businesses out there that are doing it more and more. And one of the best ones and examples of it who started way before anybody else is Patagonia clothing. You know, mm-hmm. Patagonia clothing is so much anti-consumerism he runs his whole business model based on the sort of anti-consumerism thing. And he got a $10 million tax break because of Trump's uh, new tax regulation mm-hmm. for um, corporations. And he used that $10 million to fight Trump on land reform. So, mm-hmm. you know, he, he got, and, he, and it was such a brilliant PR plan. And it wasn't even a PR plan. That's just who he is. That's what he wants to do. So <laughs> elegant, I think, is necessary in every touch point of our lives. And I still have many aspects of my life I need to become more elegant about, but it's definitely an intention, a goal and a language that I want to use more and more often because it just feels fluid when you're elegant. Mm. And speaking about leadership, John, and the sort of the future of leadership where we're heading, one of the things in the, in the book that you speak about is really fascinating. We, we come from a place where we all know what IQ is Um, and then we, you know, more currently we, we talk about EQ, um, and you also speak about AQ, which is adaptability question. Maybe why, what is that? And why is it so important? Well, I think again, it just comes down to the, 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 the concept that the linear world we were in is no more. And we are very much in a transition phase where the very essence of value is changing. And we've got to understand that what used to be valuable is not valuable anymore. And it's very similar to what happened from the, uh, from the agricultural era to the industrial era. The very essence of value changed then, and now it's starting to change again. And so when value starts to change, because we're in a transition phase, half of our thinking is in the future, and a lot of our structures are stuck in the industrial times, like corporations and like educational systems. These are all industrial legacy types mm. of things. So as this value starts changing, so our leadership needs to be connected with this and to understand what value is and what priorities need to be made to what aspect of business and how this impacts your people that work with you, consumers, the environment, animals, all of this becomes a very holistic process for us to really start to adapt and accept 
part of leadership changing moving forward because the smartest person in the room today is anybody with a smartphone connected to the internet with Google on it. And so how do you manage people that are smarter than you? You've got to create adaptability environments and you've got to almost be a much more consciously aware person, not more intelligent so that you can create a team that's much more adaptable in its way of moving forward and also not caught up on bullshit, you know? And I think a lot of leaders in the past have been very much unaware human beings and they're the ones destroying the world. They're the ones who can't create teams that are fluid, emotionally aware, and are doing things that are really impactful. And I guess the kid, that also harks back to, to kids, you know, something that you should cultivate within them is, is, is that aspect. Adaptability, yeah. But you see, they've already got it. They are very adaptable because they're curious. Oh, yeah. It's just about not drumming that out of them because curiosity makes you naturally adaptive. Yeah, mm, for sure. Mm. Hey, bud, we haven't got uh, too much uh, long, long left with you, sadly. It's, uh, it's been such an epic chat. Um, but just, just kind of like a, a couple more questions. So, so what are you most excited about uh, in this kind of human revolution that is currently going on? That we've got latent potentiality within us that we haven't known about. This is incredible. You know, you come out of a Joe Dispenza meditation retreat and you're like, what? This is inside me? I can feel like this by just practicing that, that, and that. This has always been here. Why has nobody told me about this? And so for me, this awakening to our own power, awakening to our own ability to really be architects about what things are going on around us based on those five things I spoke about earlier from intention to receivership. These are new things that we're becoming aware of. And for me, it's like understanding the process of almost playing with life like a windsurfer, you know, you're pushing, you're pulling, you're letting go, you're pushing, you're pulling, you're letting go. It's almost like this nuance. So for me, this is the most exciting thing. And the more I write, the more I learn, the more I learn, the more I write about it and the better I get it. Mm -hmm, sure. Well, geez, before we ask your last question, John, we, we were just wondering what you sort of planning at the moment uh, in going forward and also where people can contact you to, to get some of this amazing knowledge that you're disseminating. Thank you so much. Um, I'm moving to Dubai in three months. I've decided that in order to be a more global player, I want to be quite literally in the center of the world, um, which gives me access to pretty much every city in the world. I also am excited about what Dubai is doing and as far as its move onto the future, it's one of the only countries I know in the world that has a minister of artificial intelligence. Hmm. And so this sort of space around Dubai excites me. So I'll be saying Dubai to Cape Town and South Africa for the moment and uh, setting up base there by October 28, uh, 2019. And so really to start off 2020 and beyond in a different environment. And also to pick up more faculty membership or faculty positions at different universities around the world because, you know, you, you, you get better and better at what you teach. And to put myself into the position to teach more to smarter people gets me to prepare myself better. And so those two things are really the focus for me. And uh, those are my next steps. Mm. And, and, and where can people uh, get hold of your books and, oh, and contact you? So yeah, I mean, everything's on my website. So johnsone.com, uh, Instagram, johnsone, LinkedIn. You know, there's only one johnsone in the world. Can you believe it? I am so lucky. There's no other johnsone. So I can say my name's Andrew Smith because there's a lot of them. And also, there's no other famous old cricketers that would name my name. So there's only one johnsone. My surname's spelled S-A-N-E-I. And uh, I'm pretty much on every social media uh, channel. I'm constantly sharing information, whether through blogs or vlogs or books. And I would love for people to join and uh, to share their comments as well. Uh, awesome, man. And, but just before we head on to the last question, it's so funny like uh, that you had to sort of like explain like how to spell your surname. I was wondering, do you ever remember the car that uh, it was a Sani that, that was in yes, South Africa? Listen, listen, Sani. Listen, Sani. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever, was there ever like any jokes about you always. and Sani? Always. always, always, always. That was <laughs> Sani. Yeah, that was S-A-N-I. Yeah, mine yeah. is that E I. So yeah, yeah, that came the closest to kind of like playing with my surname. <laughs> uh, no, I remember that car. I remember that. Car. Oh, classic. Classic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but so so just our last question is: uh, What does being ridiculously human mean to you? To be the best version of yourself and to add that best version of yourself to the fabric of society. You know, we are very lucky to have arrived on Earth at this time where the 
compounded work of geniuses before us have given us this opportunity to be living in this world with exponential technologies and consciousness growing around us. And so reading Ridiculously Human is to tapping into more of your genius so you can add it to the fabric of society and humankind. So everybody who's coming next has got a better opportunity to be better versions of themselves to add more value to humanity. So Ridiculously Human is really about connecting to your own genius more than anything else. Mm. I love that, but I love that. And it's like, it's actually, it's such a privilege to be alive and we need to realize this. And therefore it's a responsibility for us to be our best version. So like you said, we can help other people in the future and just kind of what we're going through. So that's a, that's an awesome one. But yeah, um, the brilliant thing is, is when you tap into that genius, you realize that it's endless. So yeah. you become comfortable in being abundant and generous. You know, it's, it's yeah. obvious. So why would you want to be keeping it? In fact, Ayahuasca told me once, he said, there's a rule with you accessing your genius. The rule is you must keep sharing it because if you stop sharing it, it will stop giving you access to it. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's pretty deep. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow, but so just wanted to quickly cool. say uh, thanks so much uh, for coming on our podcast again, but then, um, you know, you say you're a doctor, Dr. Joe Dispenza fan. I'm a massive uh, John Sane fan. So um, you know, I'm, I'm your fanboy, but, <laughs> uh, and, uh, but it's just, um, it's just amazing listening to you. You know what I mean? And you, you bring this epic energy and wisdom with you. Um, I, I really, I, I just think it's like enthralling and um, I'm just really excited about everything that you share and all the people that you're going to impact and change in this world. Um, and Thank it's you. just, uh, it's just super awesome to kind of be part of it, man. Uh, you're a, you're a total legend um, please keep smiling, keep doing amazing things and, uh, just, yeah, thanks for, you know, coming into our life and, and for this emergence, it's really epic, but so appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, it's so, it's so delicious of you to say, man. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. You can see I'm grinning. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very enthused to be part of this and thank you for the time. For it. I really appreciate it. And just briefly, John, from my side, I just like to add just something small, like Gareth, you know, I feel exactly the same, obviously. And just one thing you said earlier about allowing space to fill yourself with light so that you actually see more. That was like super profound for me. And I, I just see you doing that. There, there is a certain light about you that you are radiating. And, um, and, and that's just, so that was just like you epitomize that actually. So, so that was really cool and Thanks. elegant as well, which, which kind of flows from that light emanating from you is that, there's a certain elegance about the way you, you do things. And the last thing that I was thinking that, that really struck me today was you allow people to see that people are, or there are people out there thinking these things. So that means it's a thing. Do you know what I mean? So, so some of the concepts you're talking about, it's on paper, it's real. People are talking about it. And I had never thought of some of the things. So you're giving people permission to realize that, this is something that's happening in the world. So you are allowed to now start thinking about it too, buddy. Do you know what I mean? So, so, so yeah, thanks wow. for that. And, yeah. um, and, yeah. I, and I really dig that, uh, that, that aspect. So, so thanks from our side as well. Well, thank you. I think, I think the most important thing is to make these very complex scenarios as simple as possible so that people mm-hmm. aren't scared away from them and also just really make it a gradual process for people to start changing their behavior. So it doesn't have to be something cataclysmic that happens you know so and i think it's really just been a gift i've just always had this gift to be able to take these complex scenarios and make them simple maybe because my brain requires the simplicity of things so that i can really grasp it and i think that that process has allowed me to share it in books and talks and that sort of stuff so thank you man I, i really appreciate all your kind words and it's very much uh uh a lot of respect back to both of you because like i said before we were on air that I get a lot of requests for podcasts, but you guys infuse me and what you're doing. And I'm very proud to be part of your process as well and uh, watch each other's journeys become exponential. Thank you. Yes. (laughs) Thanks, buddy. (laughs) Cool, my man. So, yeah, man. But thanks so much. It's uh, it's just super inspiring speaking with you man it's uh I'm, I'm sure i'm sure you get get that often but it's nice just to you know to sort of confirm that it's, it's, no, really- it's wonderful to hear i mean and, and it doesn't matter how many times you hear it it's weird to hear because it's <laughs> you're, just, you're just yourself i mean it's, it's not like yeah. i'm doing it yeah. it's always weird to 
hear, but it's always wonderful to hear. So thank you. But you, and you make it of- concise, like you said, and your brain is somehow munching down this information and, 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 and releasing a, 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 from an entropy state into a sort of a, um, a controlled state. That's the way I see it, the way you do it. And then the, so you've taken all this, this chaos that, and then putting it into a thing. And, and that's kind of, yeah, it's just such a cool thing, man, to see. Thank you. And it's, it's, the, it's the reverse of the, of the <laughs> yes, exactly funneled the in. <laughs> yeah, exactly the reverse. Uh, cool, wow. Man. I never thought of that. But okay, guys, thanks so much, cool. buddy. Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour and up in the air. Stop at the toll, digging for change, snowy cape.